Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hello and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Prophet, and I'm here with Aaron Tilton, the CEO of SmartFi. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having us, Monica. You know, um, I know you've been telling these stories a lot, so I uh, I know you're going to have to repeat yourself, which is fine. But you've it sounds like you've been really getting a lot of attention on SmartFi and what you're able to bring to economies that don't even know they're being touched by crypto, really, but bringing the best of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency into existing markets. And that's really kind of what SmartFi is focused on. SmartFi being essentially a platform where we lend loans, we fund loans, and you do it, though, in a very unique way. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about the twist on just normal lending that you're really doing with cryptocurrency and with SmartFi. Yeah, so the, the, the real twist here is that in a normal lending environment, whether it's a bank or you know, non-bank lenders, they have institutional money that they go to first. And uh, you know, what, what people don't really re realize about lending is that a bank typically doesn't have all the money that it needs. It goes and it borrows money from another bank or another lender. And so they, they generate or originate a loan and then they'll either sell it to somebody else and that person uh, you know, processes the loan and then they service the loan. Um, but most of it is an institutional activity, big giant corporations that get cheap dollars from the Federal Reserve or other, you know, other places or uh, other lending. So what we do is we've kind of turned that upside down on its head using blockchain technology and allowing the average person to now become a small piece of that lending process. So what we would normally do is you could come by a SmartFi token and then we use the proceeds of that token to fund the loan. And that allows this process for the average person to be somewhat like a banking experience instead of a trading experience. It's a lot less involved, but the capital appreciation or the value of the token can appreciate just as much, even if you're not out there trying to trade it or you know, it doesn't have the volatility and it resists kind of the bear market experience where it would crash and then jump up. That's kind of, uh, that is muted in what we do because it's more like a banking experience. It tends to just go up as the loan portfolio goes up. So when you buy a SmartFi token, let me just get this straight, because I'm thinking yeah. about like micro lending platforms like Kiva, where you can, you know, help women in Africa start their small business by putting $2,000 on a loan that, you know, based on their profile, they've paid these back in the past and the risk is there, but it's not great and da da da. Um, and peer to peer lending is something that cryptocurrency isn't required for, although it can be very additive there. When you say into the pool of loans, you're really saying when someone buys a smart fi token, they're buying sort of like an index fund of all of your loans, aggregate all together, right? So it's going to go up according to just how the loans are performing. Is that right? Well, it, we don't tie the value of the token to the interest or any of those things because that would be a security, right? And we don't sell securities or any of those things. What we do is say the more loans as an aggregate total that we have the price of the token goes up. And so we sell it at a higher price. And so the basis for that token, when you bought it, you know, our original price came out at 70 cents. It's at $1.29 now, four weeks later, right? Because the loan portfolio has gone up and we've funded loans, but the, the index is built on two pieces. How many tokens are currently available and how many loans have we funded? And so the combination of those two things 
we have a set index that says when we sell so many tokens, the price of the token is going to go up. So it's similar to like other token sales that people might have participated in before. But the difference is it's just not a arbitrary number of how far it goes up. It's linked to performance and uh, to a, a value of a loan portfolio. So it has something to tie its value to. That's an incredible way to work around securities uh, specifics because it, it seems like it's so close to a security. And yet if it's really just tied to things that are more in flux, like total su circulation supply of something and its utility within an ecosystem, yeah. that Chinese wall that you sort of built is, is an interesting one to, to keep you out of the you know, muck of securities uh, law. So how long have you been doing, um, you know, whether it's SmartFi specifically, or the, I think if there's a legacy company before this that maybe wrapped yeah. into it, Power Block Coin. Yeah, I think we're a little bit unique in that space and that uh, our company is not new. Um, our company began in, in 2007 and we were an energy infrastructure development company. We innovated development processes for uh, large scale infrastructure processes and projects like a, a new nuclear power plant. We were the developer on a new nuclear power plant. Uh, also, we own an oil and gas pipeline construction business. So our basis in this business is kind of crazy how we got here. Um, I think everybody, or at least most people in the space know that electricity is a significant component of the cost of mining cryptocurrencies, and in, in particular, Bitcoin. And, and so uh, in 2017, 10 years after we had started our other business, our energy infrastructure business, we started getting calls from people saying, gosh, I would like to have, you know, this X amount of power. Do you guys have any? And when I heard the kind of power that they're looking for, it's like the size of a city. And I said, what are you guys doing with all this power, right? It, it, it could only be a few things. And one of which was data centers. And that's what it turned out to be almost, but it was mining cryptocurrencies. Right. And so we had these people saying, gosh, we're going to build these big projects and need all this power. And we need help finding this, you know, the power and the location. So we started helping them find locations for uh, Bitcoin mining facilities in the Western U.S. And, and optioning off other projects. And in fact, we started dealing with people in China. And, and when it got down to uh, certain aspects of it, uh, in fact, in one instance in particular, in 2018, in January, the price of cryptocurrency started to fall. It was up at 20,000 at the right. high. I think maybe you remember this point. Oh my gosh. It was a yeah, big Yeah, I mean, and previous the year before, Bitcoin was at 1,700 bucks when we right. first started right. talking to people, right? Yeah. Went all the way up to 20,000. Everybody was thinking, oh, this is never going to end. Well, as it always does, it's, it's a volatile commodity. The price came off and it went back down to, you know, roughly around $3,800 or 3,500. Maybe in some cases it was 32, but uh, it still was up almost double, but everybody made all these plans thinking it would be at 20,000. And yeah. so we had all these cryptocurrency miners come back to us and say, hey, you know, the project we were working on, we got to put it on hold because the coin's not worth as much. So having our background in commodities, we said, look, why don't we take the structure that we know how to finance in other commodities like oil and gas and electricity and sell a forward price curve so you can give us your crypto, we'll hold it as collateral, but we will give you the dollars to keep finishing your projects. And that's how we started as a non-bank lender. It all started with mining cryptocurrencies and our background in electricity. Oddly enough, those things converge. So uh, from that time forward, we, we would actually fund anybody. You didn't have to be a miner. So we funded uh, cryptocurrency ATM companies, uh, cryptocurrency private jet companies that are funded with cryptocurrency, uh, some real estate, uh, you name it, pretty much. I mean, we funded stuff we have no idea what it was used for, right? We just do loans for anybody as long as they have cryptocurrencies. Now going forward, the evolution of that is SmartFi, which we're broadening the scope of how to utilize cryptocurrencies in a simplified way that allows you to engage in, the, in what we you know, essentially call the normal economy or the regular economy, right? That's kind of our story. You know, you've really been in this space for a long, long time. You're, you're, you're at the cusp of intersecting and intersectional, like several different things that really need to be benefiting from one another. 
And it's amazing what SmartFly has done already just to, to make that happen in the lending space. But I can't help but wonder, since you talk about not a lot of people were just around like I was, like you were back you know, in the yeah. last spike and even before that. And so you know, I can remember when I first heard about Bitcoin or heard about blockchain for Bitcoin. And I remember when I first invested in it and what made me do it. Those are all you know, stories that sound very, very antiquated now if you look at the prices of things and you think, yeah. why isn't she a billionaire? She didn't hold, that's why, guys. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, how, when, can you tell me what the story is of when you first heard about crypto or blockchain and you thought, huh, what's, like, I'm gonna start thinking about that. What, what, what is that, when was that and what, what it was it about? Yeah, it was in uh, about April of 2017. I started hearing a little, you know, media about it, different things. I really didn't understand it, didn't know anything about it, right? I think that's most people, you know, with any industry. It's kind of a, I equate it back to, I've, I, you know, I've been around long enough where I remember this happening with the internet. I worked for an ISP, you know, back, uh, well, this would have been uh, 1999. Uh, and and that's, you know, very similar. The, the internet was, you know, a few years old in a commercial basis, right? And and uh, everybody still had dial-up. I remember getting the CD from <laughs> yep. AOL, you know, in the mail, you know, get a free trial of AOL. And uh, I started working as the, the director of sales for this technology company that was building uh, what they called wide area networks. And I, I won't bore you with all the details, but long story short, I watched that same process happen from you know, the, the kind of sort of the beginning to the, a crash and then this steady growth with real business models that made money, right? There's stories of pet, pets.com and all these guys. So I had the same thoughts in early 2017, you know, Bitcoin was at 1700 bucks or so. And I started thinking about this and, and whether there was something there, but it really never came full steam until I got a call from a neighbor of mine that said, don't you do something with electricity? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, we're developing a nuclear power plant and you know, a lot of other things that we've done in the, the critical infrastructure space. And he said, I need some power to mine Bitcoin. Do you know anything about Bitcoin? <laughs> Wait, and that and was in April of 2017. When did you hear, I need some power to Bitcoin, mine Bitcoin? Yeah, that, it was more end of April, 1st of May. Okay. Yeah, that was it. And then, once I got introduced to it, it didn't take me very long. I'd actually worked for another company uh, after I worked for the ISP where we built similar technology that, that Bitcoin mining uh, servers use. They're ASICs, right? Application specific integrated circuits, right? And uh, we, we were using field programmable gate arrays and other things. I'm on board with all the, that stuff. And frankly, I was the dumb guy there. I was a sales guy, not the smart technology guy, right? But we, we built those things. And so my background in that hardware and software combined with the concept of mining cryptocurrencies and electricity all kind of coalesced for about two weeks after we learned about this. And I thought, you know, there's a model here that we can have an impact on. And then over the, the next several years, it started to evolve. Wow. That's, that is um, an, an early story. And that's, it's wonderful to see that not only SmartFi has been around this long and that you have this kind of experience, you've watched multiple now, you know, full runs and everything else. Yeah. You, you've thought about stability of a coin's value and you also have, until the SEC comes up with some new, I don't know, idea on what's a good idea, then you've, you've basically played by the rules that were set forth so far. So well done. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that goes exactly kind of to the point. The other background that I have, uh, for better or worse, is I, I was in the state legislature for five years, so I was an elected official, and uh, I sat on the, uh, I was a vice chair of the Public Utilities and Technology Committee in the House, so I helped develop laws related to utilities, technologies, um, and then also on other committees, so you get really familiar with the law, and also having done large transactions, I'm pretty familiar with securities laws, and on and on and on, so combining kind of a lot of those things, our goal was to make a technology and a token that had safety first, so it could not run afoul of securities and lending laws and all these other things. So we designed it that way specifically to make sure that it's compliant and that we shouldn't have any issues with regulators, both at the federal level and the state level. Yeah, you said something like, uh, was it security or safety first, speculation second? 
Yep, exactly. That is a very uncommon thing to hear in uh, in crypto of any sort. So yeah, I love that. Um, you, I think you talked a bit um, with me earlier about some commercial loans that you have funded. And you know, my background being in tokenizing real estate, I'm very curious as to how you've yeah. gone about this project. Can you tell me a bit about the project that you ended up coming in as a lender and you were able to use crypto to do so? Yeah, so um, the first couple of projects that, we, that I talked to you about, uh, and one of which is still ongoing, but the other ones are uh, uh, the equipment back lending for small businesses. We did our first $2 million over the last two months as test cases. Everything is working out really well. Um, very simple. Those are the average small business owner that needs fifty dollars to $100,000 to invest in their restaurant or construction company or whatever it is, right? Mo the, the average person, in fact, most people, 80% of people are employed by a small business, not a large corporation. So ID, from our ideology is that that's who we're, we're out to help. And that's where we think that if you have adoption of a technology, it needs to be with 80% of the people in small businesses. So that's where we're testing that and we're funding those loans. So we have a group that originate the loans for us. And then we use the, the uh, funds from selling the token to fund those loans. And we do it on a portfolio basis. So we're not making the loans directly. Somebody else uh, goes through the process. It takes about 90 days for that loan to be processed. And then we fund it and then we own the paper on it. Um, but we have somebody else that services it. The commercial real estate aspect is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, over a year ago, we had one of our shareholders in our business uh, on, on the energy side of the business that owned uh, and does own today a couple hundred million dollars worth of uh, commercial real estate. And they talked about the difficulty in originating those processes, the long nature of that, the difficulties in dealing with banks and you yep. know the SBA, if they're ever going to do you know, just all the craziness around Oh, Lord. It. Yeah. And um, so we started talking to him and said, well, what if we did this? Would this solve problems for you? And I said, yeah, you know, made this shorter um, or did this kind of thing. And, and so we're still taking kind of a bank approach to underwriting the project where they've got to do all the same things that a bank would do, but because we're not regulated uh, by you know, the banking industry and our approach is much more collaborative, like our other loans, cryptocurrency loans, uh, we try to make them quicker, but yet still secure. And so we, we eliminated some of these things that we worked directly with them on, on this process and we were able to find a way forward. It took us about a year we had to do a, a lot of infrastructure upgrades and things that we're doing. We're still doing with some software, but long story short, it'll be underwritten like a bank would do it, but eliminate a lot of the red tape, yep. but provide the same kind of security interest in it. And so we're doing a project. Uh, the first project is about $18 million and uh, we'll start funding that here in about 90 days. And we've already helped fund some uh, homes but they were for commercial investment, you know, or an investment purpose. Um, and they either did some down payments or some other things with them. But we're, we're innovating in that lending space, which allows us to kind of build this safety first, speculation second approach, yeah. where it's the, the, the quality of the portfolio um, and the amount of the portfolio that adds the value to the token, not the interest that we earn, right? And the interest actually is, we do some different things with that, but I'll, I'll, I can get into that later if you want to know about that. No, no, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I do, uh, I recall you mentioning something about a, um, a buyback guarantee that yeah. is really interesting. I don't think I've heard about that in any other cryptocurrency ever. So how does yeah. the buyback guarantee work? Yeah, so I, I think we're the only people that we know of or any projects that we know of that have a buyback guarantee uh, and what we do is we don't guarantee to buy back at a current price or some speculative level. When you buy the token, whatever you put in, let's say it was $100, uh, because the proceeds are going to fund the loans, that value stays. And so if you don't like the price of our token in a year from now, you could always come back and say, hey, I want my original purchase price back. So it gives you a, a you know, a hedge, that's in the trading world, that would be a hedge where you're staying even. 
or like in a bank, if you, when you take yeah. your money to the bank, you expect to get back what you put in. So that's kind of where we designed this safety first feature. And we're so confident in what we're doing and what's happened over the last, you know, five years in our lending process, we know that we'll always be able to give that back to you because the money doesn't go anywhere. It goes into a loan. And if the value of the token is tied to the increase in the loan portfolio, the price will go up. So you, you know, the likelihood that you're going to want to give us back your token at a lower price because that's what you paid for it. You won't do that. You'll take the higher price. So it's safety first, speculation second. But that's how the buyback guarantee works. That's incredible. That's really amazing. And um, how many? What is your assets under management at this point with this with this token and what it's it's been able enables you to do? Yeah, so with SmartFi in particular, it's well over 100 million already. And what we did actually, when we went live with the uh, SmartFi process and the SmartFi token, which was September 16th, we did the, the launch and the token sale. Uh, we, in the first 40, uh, 24 hours, we sold out 8 million tokens for roughly about $5.6 million in 24 hours. So it went well. And these were to retail investors or accredited only? No, this is retail because it's it's a token, right? right. So anybody, in fact, it was a fair launch. We didn't do a lot of, you know, where some uh, large VC group came in yeah. and bought a bunch of tokens and they get- Let their cheaper. friends do we it first. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't do that. It was a fair launch. One, because we don't need that kind of capital. We don't sell our, and, and we're already been profitable for a long time. We've already, before that launch, we had already done a billion dollars in loans and transactions already. So this is a, really the opportunity for the average person to come by the token. That's our goal is to make cryptocurrencies usable. You don't have to be some you know, crazy trader and spend your day day trading your cryptocurrencies to get value. You can yeah. buy it and then watch it, right? And just check in on it like you would a you know retirement account or something like that, you know, that you're just watching. Like an index fund, portfolio. which it actually is. It's an index fund, right? Yeah. Well, it's not a fund, Ish. Ish. but it is, the token is indexed to the portfolio of loans. And so you just watch the loans and watch them go up. And that's then the, the price of your, your coin or the value of the token will go up on the secondary market. Here's again, kind of a regulatory issue is that uh, the buyback is for what you bought it for, but you can trade it on the secondary market for more. That's where you would go to get your capital appreciation. We also on our exchange, we're trading that token. We're, we're helping to make a market in our token. So you can go to this secondary market um, or uh, over the next 90 days, it should be listed on several other exchanges and you should be able to start going to other places to trade it. That's where you get your gains from, is in the it's, secondary market. And what is the ticker for the SmartFi token? SMTF. SMTF. Yep. Smart money to Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Till Friday. Yep. Just SmartFi. Yep. That's fantastic. So, yeah, so to, to be clear, you can buy it and trade it on our platform. Again, we have our own exchange, so we don't need to go to other exchanges, but we will be doing that for more liquidity. It's always better, obviously, to have more liquidity and be traded other places. Of course. So over the next several months, that's part of our roadmap is uh, multiple exchanges trading the token. We already are in discussions with these, uh, with these other platforms and other exchanges, and we'll bring that forward. That's fantastic. And if I was just like, an average person, you know, just learned about this first time I'm hearing about SmartFi, really want to learn more, make sure it's right for me. And then I look at the risk of it, the tolerance that I have for that, figure out if I want to buy any or just learn more. Yep. Where would I go and where would you think is the best entry point? Is it buy a token and learn by watching that? Because if you buy it, it gives you skin in the game. So you really want to become educated or is it yeah scour your knowledge base and your FAQs and, or is it join your telegram community? Like, where do you think is the best place for the average person to learn the most about any cryptocurrency they're really interested in, but especially one that has a platform and such a, a direct involvement to existing markets, how do they learn more and what's the best first step? Well, so, so it's interesting you'd ask that my, my aunt, um, I won't tell you how old she is, she probably wouldn't like that, but <laughs> she came to me She's actually a, a computer programmer, but knows nothing about cryptocurrency. So she's very technical, um, but very interested in, in her retirement program and all these other things that she's doing. Ask me that exact same question. What should I buy? What would I buy first? And here's what I would tell everybody. 
after being in, you know, in this space for five years and you know, doing over a billion dollars worth of transactions and all these things, safety first, right? Speculation second, especially for somebody who is looking at retirement, uh, looking at, 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 a, you know, at, at cryptocurrencies as something that we put in their portfolio, uh, but don't, you know, don't necessarily have 10 years to wait you know, for right. it to perform or if we go into a bear market or those things. So what I would do is two things. Uh, you could go to smartfight.com. Again, we have an exchange. We, you can buy all the cryptocurrencies there that you want in terms of the ones that we carry, but they're the top, you know, 10 in, in the marketplace, uh, which is a good place to start. More liquidity is better. Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, have good liquidity. The other ones, less liquidity, but they're still widely traded. Um, and so I would look at if I have a portion of my funds that are going to be high risk uh, and then a portion that are going to be low risk, but high return, right? And so that's how we would categorize SmartFi is that because of the buyback guarantee, you always know that you can always get your money back, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the performance of SmartFi token, it's up 84% in four weeks. It's a good return, right? And so that's a good one to do to take as well. Or Bitcoin. I had my brother-in-law bought uh, Bitcoin. He bought it at the at the peak, which was uh, roughly he bought it at fifty thousand or, or just below the peak before it hit the peak. Uh, so for a while he was kind of worried. He was like, "Hey, the price is back under what I bought it for, right?" So this volatility is the thing right. that most people need to understand. That's part of cryptocurrencies. They're going to be highly yeah. volatile. Uh, the SmartFi token is a little different because of the index. It doesn't have that kind of volatility. It resists bear market volatility. So those are kind of your two choices when you come to our platform. Uh, but they both provide the same kind of returns, right? I don't know that Bitcoin's up 84% in the last uh, four weeks, but it's certainly up. Um, but you can go to SmartFi. We have blogs on the safety first, speculation second approach uh, on the SmartFi token. You can look at the tokenomics behind that but you can also buy other cryptocurrencies there as well. So that's that's the kind of approach I would look at. That's fantastic. I think that's exactly what I would tell, especially anybody who has, by, by whatever metrics their own or just by an algorithm metric that they don't have a high risk tolerance, older in years, closer to retirement, et cetera. Like, yeah, absolutely be really cautious. But for anybody, I mean, even, even if they're 20 years old and they're highly speculative, you know, why just yep. treat it like a casino when you can treat it like something that truly will get you a return? Yeah, and has safety. And that, again, that's what we saw in the market and said there needs to be a token that does this, that has an yes. index that's safety first. So regardless of your age or when you buy it or, you know, whatever happens to it, you have the assurance, kind of like a bank-like experience or a retirement experience, not a casino experience or a trading experience. That uh, there's there's a there there is a cryptocurrency out there that can provide safety first and provide those kind of uh, speculative returns that are you know double digit triple digit. And so one question, I guess this is a little bit nerdy, but I think we've done the uh, zero to blockchain level of how to kind of start the conversation. And yeah. how, how what is the total circulating supply, or are you managing that by only minting as there's loans to back it? I, I, is it a one to one, or is this a because you said that the price of it was fl would fluctuate basically based on how it was deployed and how many were available. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So SMTF is a, a Binance Smart Chain token. So it's a BEP20 token. So you can hold it virtually. I mean, a lot, a lot of wallets are, are capable of holding a, a BEP20 token. And the fees are less. Uh, and, and maybe I'll just give you a little tidbit here for next year. We are actually doing our own clone of uh, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum virtual machine platform. So ne next year we'll have our own, our own token on our own process. We already have our own blockchain and all of that uh, will be enabled in a decentralized process for our lending and everything that we do. So we have a centralized portal now and we're testing all of that, doing all that stuff and, and, and you know, putting all of our transactions through there as all the security uh, screening, we've you know done uh, audits, we do them regularly, all that stuff is done. But going to a decentralized world is the next thing that we do next year. And um, in fact, we have nice. a lot of the developers from the Komodo community, if you're familiar with that blockchain, 
yeah. uh, they're engaged in what we're doing. And that, that uh, those developers are building a lot of our technology for this process. Um, so the token is a BEP20 token. Um, and in this, uh, in that process, um, what we would be doing now uh, for the token and for where we're going, the supply is 1 billion. That's all that there will be, right? And there's a reason for that specifically. Um, and, and the supply is already minted, so it's available. And uh, there's no mining on that. There is going to be a mining process in our, our structure. And I, I won't get it. We don't have time to get into all that. Maybe that's another podcast for another time. That's more kind of techno geeking out on there. But long story short, we have a process where you can mine stable coin that will uh -huh. then fund loans. And it's, yep. again, this is all based around uh, lending, but people can buy the, the token. There's a billion of them. And every time they're purchased at a certain amount, the supply uh, is diminished. So it uses a deflationary aspect, uh -huh. but then the price on the index goes up. So, it mimics... so are you burning any tokens? No, we do not burn tokens. Okay. Right? We don't need to because of the index. Right. So the deflation comes from increasing the price, okay. not decreasing supply. Okay. Got it. So it's very similar in that process. We just use pricing instead of tokens. Uh, as lending, you know, you can you can build up a large portfolio rapidly, pretty quickly. Um, so that's how that works. That is incredible. So it's like there's a tier of like however many are purchased, it just changes their price automatically. Yeah, we just start selling it for a higher price and, and we leave it there. No matter if people are buying it or not, we leave it there at that price. We will never change that price until the token is bought out, right? There's no, we have no incentive to drop the price or maneuver the price, those kind of things. Here is one of the interesting things that we're doing again into the future. Our lending platform has monetary policy. So just like the Federal Reserve, Think about this process, right? So the Federal Reserve has a board that says, hey, we want to increase the interest rates or lower the interest rates or increase the money supply or decrease it. The token has that voting right built into it. So later on in the next 90 days, people will be able to start voting on that type of the aspect of the monetary supply. So the interest wow. rates will be set. Now, it, it, again, it's a little bit like training wheels, right? For the for the users, they don't get to pick the interest rate because they don't know all the, the economics behind what we're doing. Right. But they can say, hey, let's increase it or decrease it, all right? And then we'll pick the rate that we think is right for the portfolio, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example where that would come into play. Let's say we had sold more tokens than we have loans to fund, which is a lot harder to do. We have way more demand than we have sales for tokens right now, but let's say that that occurred. The token holders could say, okay, um, we've got all this cash sitting around, let's drop the interest rate, which lends more people to borrow more money, which increases the price of the token again. It's a self-reinforcing cycle. Right. right. Or we could go the other way. Uh, we have, which is the condition we have right now, which is we have way more loans than we can fund, right? So we want to generate more interest in the token. So we try to rapidly get the price of the token to increase. So we are funding a lot of the loans that are already there. We've already funded them with smart five, you know, finances, our, our money that we have already. So that rapidly makes the coin appreciate in value. That's why it went up 84% in four weeks. So right. the more we get the, the token to appreciate, the more loans we can fund. But, but the we, one thing that you can't do is what the Fed just did with the United States dollar, where they just were like, well, we're going to print more. And so that's yeah. the one thing you can't do. Well, we have the opposite incentive. That's right. why it's inflationary already. And we don't have a drag on paying for the interest on you know, the, the, the debt and the treasuries, Special all those things. things. Right. So what happens is the token holders end up being like the board of the Federal Reserve. They can vote on it. They have to, you know, the, the, right. the metrics that they can look at and then increase or decrease the price. And so they actually have the ability to influence the price of the token that they hold by voting. That's wonderful. 
Wow. Yeah. That is, that is such an interesting um, innovation to come out of and to be just ahead of this debacle that's been, you know, now riddling the United States, US, US dollar and the United States economy. So I, yeah. I love this for on many, many, many levels. I mean, SmartFi is definitely smart finance, but for so yeah. many more long, long, long reaching reasons than just that we fund loans in a new decentralized way. So yeah. this is and, a really smart just, project. Just like what's happening with, you know, funding these small business loans we can decide with the people that are involved in our platform and in what we're doing and the token holders that they can decide how to help small businesses. They can increase the rates or decrease it. Right? You see how we can kind of do the same thing that the yeah. Federal Reserve would do, yeah. but we don't have any of the baggage. We don't have any of the, the craziness that yeah. goes along with the politics and all of these other things. And we're wow. already having an, an impact. This is truly, I mean, this is a far reaching for monetary policy as well as I mean, political and governance issues that being resolved in a new way. I, I'm very excited about SmartFi and I'm so glad, I'm so glad you are here to educate our listeners and viewers. This has been a really uh, wonderful conversation for me personally as well. I, I'm so glad we're in touch now because I have lots of follow-up questions for you and I hope that we can do a follow-up and dive into some of those deeper aspects. Um, I, I go back and circle with people for a second interview many times and I would, I'm sure you're going to be on my, my roster of like, knock, knock, knock. Are we ready for a second one? Because I want a yeah. round two, you know? This yeah, we'd love to give you an great. update, you know, in, in, uh, in, you know, a couple of weeks or months and tell you, hey, here's where it is now. Here's what it's doing. Here's, here's all the small businesses that we've helped this far. Here's yeah. what we did with our commercial real estate test and, you know, and show what we're doing in, the, in, a, in an economy where people have no idea that crypto is funding their loans. Exactly. This is this is just brilliant. I'm so glad that you were able to take the time and talk with me and explain this. Talk to me like I'm five and also talk to me like I'm not five. And uh, I just really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Appreciate the time as well. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. It's been fantastic talking with you. Again, I'm here with Aaron Tilton, the CEO of SmartFi. And uh, this is Monica Profit from the New Trust Economy signing off once again. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.